Hello, everyone. I'm Evo Dalder, president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and this is World Review, our weekly uh, look at the world's news. And joining us this week is, for the first time, Nahal Tusi, foreign affairs correspondent of political. Nahal, wonderful to have you join us. Thank you for having me. Also with us, Steve Erlanger, chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe for the New York Times from Brussels. Steve, great to have you back. Thank you, Evo and Nirmal Ghosh, who is the U.S. Bureau Chief of the Straight Times from Washington. Nirmal, great to have you back as well. Thank you. Well, we're, what, three or four days away from an election, uh, although the election feels like it's been going on for at least a year, and in fact has been going on already for uh, almost, uh, in fact, more than a, uh, than a month as people have been voting. Uh, the rest of the world is probably waiting uh, with as much abated breath as Americans are on the outcome of this election. Um, uh, Nahal, let me start with you. You've been writing a lot about, uh, uh, about what perhaps a Biden presidency would look like, how much of uh, Trump's foreign policy will uh, remain, what will change. Uh, how do you see it uh, sort of four days before the election? Well, I mean, let me... Let me first say that, you know, it seems like every four years of my entire life, I'm told this is the most important election of my time. Uh, but I feel like maybe this time that that actually is the case. Uh, if you're looking at the polls, it's not really even close. Biden is ahead uh, on just about every measure, including in key swing states. Uh, and there are not as many undecideds as in 2016, uh, but people are still unwilling to, you know, uh, declare victory. Uh, and I find that even among foreign diplomats that I talk to, I mean, everybody has just uh, learned the lesson from 2016, never to make prediction. Uh, now, I think it, we're also going to have to remember one other thing, which is that election, uh, it's not just a day anymore, and the results are probably going to in over a number of days. So if the world is holding its breath right now, uh, it's you know, might turn purple <laughs> by the by the time this whole thing is is uh, completed, and that's if Trump doesn't dispute the results. Uh, so, I mean, in terms of like a civics lesson for the entire world, I mean, every four years the whole world watches the American elections. It affects the whole world. But I think this time around we might see another replay of something you know even similar to 2000 or possibly even more severe. So the rest of the world is going to learn heck of a lot about American democracy and, and the way that it works. Um, and, you know, so that's why a lot of a lot of people, especially on the left, feel like Biden has to win by a lot. He can't just win by a little. Uh, and not only if he wins by a lot, it's not just a question of like, you know, that'll make the results more clear. Uh, there's also the, the hope on the left that if he wins by a lot, that sends a message to the rest of the world that America is backed, Trump was an aberration, and that Biden is going to be steering the world back into its leadership. Uh, I'm sorry, the, America back to its leadership position uh, on the on the global stage, uh, and you know, taking the reins on a number of issues. Now, uh, I think you know my predictions in terms of Biden versus Trump foreign policy. Uh, I think we're going to see that Biden is definitely going to you know talk the talk at least a little more on human rights, on promoting democracy, uh, and to some extent walk the walk. Uh, and he has already said he wants to have a summit of democracies, that sort of thing. Uh, but I also think he really is going to try to patch up the hard feelings that have emerged between the U.S. and its allies under Trump. If Trump wins, uh, honestly, like I would not be surprised if the U.S. leaves NATO, if uh, other sorts of agreements just crumble. I don't think he'll necessarily want to renew the New START Treaty. Uh, with Russia. There's just a lot of these things that, you know, it's, it's a question of like building under Biden versus more walking away and, and tearing down under Trump. And look, depending on which side of this political spectrum you're on, you might think those things are good for America in the long run. And I, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. So, uh, uh, no, great uh, intro. Uh, a lot of things to unpack here. Let, let's let's focus on sort of three big things here. One is sort of what if there is a contested election, and how is the rest of the world going to look at that? What what image? What what does that tell uh, the rest of the world about about American democracy? Nirmal, uh, when when you talk to your folks back home in Southeast Asia, uh, when they look at at this election, when they see the kind of questions that are being raised about 
uh, uh, about the fairness, about whether it's rigged, uh, and all of that sort of thing. What what do you hear? What are the concerns uh, uh, of of Asian uh, publics, and of course the leaders there? Uh, and I'm, I'm painting with a broad a broad brush. Of course, it's a big part of the uh, it's a big region. But how do they look at this election uh, in terms of its mechanics and what it means for the United States as a democracy? Well, I think one of the takeaways is that, uh, and this has dented the idea of, uh, severely dented the idea of American exceptionalism. Uh, I think it's important to, for outsiders to look at America as good as any other country. I've always maintained that as a foreign correspondent, you you know, you know, should have expectations. In, in any country you operate in, and America is no exception to that. And I think this last, uh, these last few years have uh, sort of uh, eroded the, the idea of American exceptionalism and this uh, election, the way it's, uh, we'd have to see how it pans out. I mean, there's a high potential for violence, for street-level violence. If the results are close enough to be disputed by one party or the other, um, in terms of who <clears throat> who wins and what the implications are, I think very quickly if uh, President Trump wins re-election, and uh, by the way, I, I, I'm very cautious about this. I think there are too many states which are still toss-ups. So I, I, it's... Uh, it's it's very deceptive. Um, so if President Trump wins re-election, I think in time he will eventually try to withdraw troops from Japan and South Korea. Um, he that will inevitably over time lead to South Korea and Japan contemplating seriously contemplating you know going weaponizing their nuclear uh, capability, right? So that is the long-term implications of that. Uh, of course, uh, as Nahal said, there are the issues with NATO and so forth. Um, if Joe Biden wins, I believe the, the party is somewhat divided on the attitude towards uh, China, which is the big thing to watch, of course, for us in the region, the US-China relationship. And I think there are sort of differences of opinion in terms of what the existential threat really is. Some people say it's the climate change. Global warming is the existential threat. And the US has to work with other big countries like China in order to do something about it. Now, how to carve out a, a sort of compartmentalized uh, little areas where you work with China on climate change, on say transnational organized crime, because uh, you have the fentanyl problem as well from China, those kinds of things. How do you do that and yet maintain strategic competition, which is not going to go away either? So I think the, the, that's the aspiration, but it might collide with the reality of great power competition. Um, I think some sort of something in between might emerge uh, with uh, Joe Biden trying to, um, trying to do this, trying to uh, engage with China and uh, sort of put back uh, diplomatic, conventional diplomatic, high-level diplomatic engagement. Aside from the, right now, diplomatic engagement has been basically focused really on trade. And that's it, nothing nothing much else. So I think he will try, uh, Joe Biden administration will try and restore some of the missing parts in that, restore the high-level diplomacy. But we'll have to um, continue to uh, compete, certainly. I mean, there's no two ways about it. And he, he himself has said, he said, he said a couple of things which are interesting. The other day on 60 Minutes, he said that Russia is a, is a bigger threat, right? So that's, that's another thing altogether. I mean, two threats. And he's also sort of emphasized uh, making America and all that. So, you know, that, that will continue to be the case. And the sort of, there's some sort of wishful thinking in Asia that he might consider returning to uh, the new incarnation of the TPP. But, you know, he, if Joe Biden wins, he still has to sort of uh, contend with a very wide swath of the American public, which doesn't want that. So he can't suddenly become returned to untrammeled globalism, right? It's not going to happen. So I think, um, I think the expectations in Asia would have to be somewhat moderated. The other big thing, the, the other big relationship, which is now sort of in a bit of a, uh, on an upswing is in uh, India, America relationship, right? I mean, because of the quad and so forth and Pompeo is there, he's been doing a tour of India, Sri Lanka, uh, he's, he was in Vietnam. Uh, that's quite interesting. And I think India is would find it somewhat difficult to 
navigate a Joe Biden administration, a Democratic administration, which is, you know, as Nahal said, is traditionally makes a little more noise in human rights. Uh, Democratic Congress, uh, you know, representatives in Congress have already made a bit of a noise about India's record in Kashmir and all that. So the sort of bonhomie of the Trump-Modi uh, relationship uh, will be somewhat, uh, you know, diminished under Joe Biden. But I think the overall closeness of the relationship in terms of intel sharing, defense and all will prevail, will, will uh, be maintained. Uh, again, uh, lots of things we can delve in here, uh, Nirmal, including the really important relationship with India uh, that you just ended up with. But Steve, in, in, in Europe, bo both on the, on the important issue of, of what is happening with American democracy, or at least how it is perceived. And, you know, for those who, who know me, I, I grew up in, uh, in Europe and, and came to the United States as that beacon of democracy. Uh, not too many people uh, of my age when I left, which was my early 20s, are looking at the United States in that way. Uh, uh, and of course, the larger question of the expectation of what will happen after the election. Yeah, well, it is true. The shining city on the hill looks pretty tarnished. I mean, looks pretty tarnished because of the way COVID's been handled, though I must say Europeans are up, stopped being quite so patronizing now that cases have surged back there. Um, but there is a sense that the U.S. democracy is cracking. It's cracking under the weight of this deep emotional polarization that Trump feeds, uh, to be sure, um, but clearly he's touching nerves that are there and there for a reason. As um, we've just heard, 40% perhaps of Americans are fervent Trump supporters after four years of Trump. They're not gonna go away. In Europe, there's a sense that Biden, who would be 78 if Biden wins, um, and of course I'm the person who said even Hillary Clinton could beat Donald Trump four years ago. But if Biden wins, he'll be 78 years old. He overlooks, I must say, pretty fragile. It looks like he's cemented in place sometimes when, when he's standing there. Um, and there, people are worried he'll be a one-term president. In four years, you could elect another Republican who would be younger, more coherent, more strategic than Trump. You know, you can name who you know, who want. Um, and then American foreign policy would turn again. So there's just this worry that American foreign policy, which used to be consistent, is no longer consistent. That, and, and people will look at it with a degree of contingency. They're not going to take huge risks for Joe Biden because they're not sure it's actually going to matter over time. I'm less worried about NATO if Trump wins. I don't think Congress is going to let the U.S. pull out of NATO, but Evo, you're the former NATO ambassador, you know better. Um, and um, I think the worry is if Trump wins, he'll just be Trump unbound. I mean, he works by instinct anyway, who knows what his instincts will be like in, in um, two years time. And there is a lot of worry fed by perhaps slightly hysterical pieces um, that we've been reading about how America is gonna break out into riots after, after the election, um, but there is worry about a contested vote. I mean, Trump is the man who said in 2016 that the election he won was rigged. So what's he gonna say if he actually loses this one? There'll be court cases, there'll be challenges. Robert Kagan just wrote a terrifying op-ed piece in the Washington Post um, suggesting trouble to come, but we'll, but we'll see. The thing people are also, I must say sophisticated people here are looking at the Senate as almost more important. If the Democrats take over the Senate, that will make a tremendous difference no matter who wins the presidency. But America looks like a democracy that's creaking a system that isn't recognizing the popular vote. Um, the last, I mean, two of the last three elections uh, with a Supreme Court that is just, someone's just been hammered through. I'm sure she's intelligent and all the rest of it, but it's been done in a completely part way. So that just the sense of democracy um, being utterly partisan 
is I think what, what, what people fear and they fear it's coming their way. Uh, let me just on, 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 on NATO, since it is something I know a little bit about, uh, <laughs> my, my worry, my worry is, is less that there's a formal getting out of NATO, uh, in part because I think, Steve, you're right, that the Congress will prevent that. And Congress has been extraordinarily supportive of NATO uh, repeatedly. The problem, of course, is, and, and, and I think you, you are hearing this in, uh, in Europe, uh, is that if you have a president who doesn't care about NATO, it doesn't really matter whether you're in or you're not, no, no longer going to rely uh, and base your foreign policy and your security policy on the presumption of American, America will be there uh, and changes will happen. I think that's the dynamic that you'll see. But I think importantly, and, and Nahal, coming back to you, uh, is 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 the sense that you have, and Steve uh, mentioned it, and 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 also wrote it in a story he did uh, about a week ago, uh, that it really doesn't matter uh, in some ways. Who uh, it does matter, whether it's Biden or Trump, but the fear that somehow America's predictability is gone, and that that's not coming back. Uh, how do you do? Do you hear that from diplomats as you walk? or Zoom your way through uh, uh, the Washington uh, diplomatic establishment. Not too many cocktail parties going on these days, even in Washington. Uh, uh, what's this sense of, of the predictability? And, and also, what do you hear from Biden folks to say, no, we're, we can reassure you that, that uh, we can come back uh, in that way? God, I have so many things I wanna say. Uh, but, um, first of all, yeah, look, there is a sense, and frankly, there has been since Barack Obama, that America is shifting its role in the world, that America is retrenching a bit. Now, it depends on what region in particular you're thinking of, right? So, you know, among the Middle East diplomats, there's definitely like a belief that, you know, even Biden has saying he wants an endless wars, that sort of thing, that they, that they are going to be less of a priority, right? So that's, that's one shift. Um, and they feel like this type of thing goes back um, all the way to Obama. Uh, and the idea that America doesn't necessarily wanna be um, the world's policeman, that sort of thing, there is a sense that that's going to continue as well. So there are people who feel like they can't necessarily rely on the US to be there for them um, completely uh, the way that they felt that they, that they once could. Uh, there's another dynamic I think that is affecting this, which is that, um, you know, there, there are the questions I want to say about like whether it's going to be a pendulum swim back and forth. Um, but you got to also like separate talking from doing, right? And so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, Biden has a lot of rhetoric that seems designed to say we're, we're back, we're everywhere, we're taking the lead, but the actions are going to matter a lot more. And the other dynamic is that he is under pressure so much from progressives uh, to take policy steps on the foreign policy front. Uh, that seem in some way to echo what Trump has wanted to do. I mean, there's a lot of skepticism on the progressive side about trade deals, for instance. There's a lot of skepticism, I mean, tons, about troop deployments. There, there are progressives who have written to Biden asking him to cut the Pentagon budget by $200 billion. And so it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, I don't think we're going to see a change in overseas and people thinking we can't necessarily rely on the US the way that we once did uh, because of trends once again, going all the way back to Obama. And if I could just add one more point on the NATO front, you know, one thing that we've noticed under Trump is first of all, and we've known this, but, but really it's been shown is he has so much power as the president over foreign policy. I mean, the president has just extraordinary uh, levers of power, controls the whole executive branch, can tell them what to do and what not to do we might be able to technically say we're still in NATO. Congress can pass resolutions and laws saying, yes, we're not leaving NATO, don't you dare leave NATO, right? But if Trump decides he doesn't wanna show up to a summit, if he ordered the State Department not to hold any more meetings with NATO allies, I mean, I'm just you know, throwing that stuff out there. I mean, there's not a lot Congress can do to stop him. Uh, and so this idea that like, that Congress has so much power. I mean, I don't know. I just feel like when it comes to foreign policy, Congress has lost long ago, ceded a lot of control of that. And, and you know, and I think especially if Trump wins again, Republicans are going to be so in fear of him. They will do whatever he wants. I would not put. I would not put 
um, you know, ending their support for NATO out of the realm of possibility on that. I really wouldn't, especially if he wins again. It, it will be a different world, Nirmal. And, and, and if you uh, is sitting in Asia, particularly these core precepts of Americans' presence, the fact that the United States in Asia uh, as a counterbalance to, uh, to China has long been in Asia as a counterbalance to China. It's become heated in some ways, but also uh, the country that has tried to open up all markets and, and been that that was sort of the way in which the United States for so long has engaged in Asia and it seems that on both of those issues, there are real question marks, uh, no matter who wins. Uh, uh, and, and, and what's the consequence then for the countries in Asia when it comes to how are they going to react with a lesser American presence and or uh, an absence of, of uh, free and open trading uh, system and greater protectionism on the part of the United States? What's the, what's the impact of that on, on the development within Asia itself? Well, we have to see the degree to which America remains engaged, uh, um, and where, and what does it do about red lines? If you look back at Trump, there was a certain amount of appreciation in Asia for, in Southeast Asia at least, for what uh, President Trump did uh, with uh, Syria in, you know, striking Syria when Bashar Assad used um, chemical weapons. So that was seen as enforcing a red line. But of course, I mean, a lot remains to be seen. What happens in the South China Sea? And I think we've spoken about this before, what happens if China sort of takes over something, or, you know, if it attacks Taiwan, uh, the big question, right? What is, will the US go to war with Taiwan? Uh, I, it's quite clear that President Trump does not want any new sort of endless wars. Um, and the sort of endless wars thing dates all the way back to Vietnam, actually. It's, it's quite interesting. I find it ironic that, uh, that President Trump is almost is almost has a lot in common with the left, actually, the sort of so-called left in American politics, in the sense that he doesn't want Americans to go and you know die in you know, strange remote battlefields. But uh, yeah, I think it, it, it is going to be depending on what America does. Does America sort of stand back and then, if necessary, take action remotely? I mean, a lot of the stuff that the Pentagon is doing is designed to sort of leap frog, right? I mean, this space wars concept and all take out Chinese satellite, that kind of thing. Trying to leapfrog conventional notions of warfare as we know it now. But I think, I think it's, as I said, I think if um, President Trump wins and he eventually takes troops back or, or draws down troops from South Korea and Japan, it raises the question of uh, going nuclear for the two countries. And of course, Japan's long been, you know, taboo, but not any longer. And uh, North Korea has already been somewhat legitimized, done nothing about denuclearization, is not likely to do anything. Why would you, why would a country denuclearize, right? Unless it has absolutely cast iron and overwhelming incentive to do so, it's not going to happen. So there'll be, um, all the countries will arm up and it will be a more sort of uh, uh, dangerous world out there. I, I would say, you know, and, and within Asia, I think there's not much. ASEAN is already somewhat split. You have Laos basically come under China's shadow, Cambodia to a great degree. And uh, so it's uh, uncertain, at, 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 at best uncertain. Now, now again, if, if, uh, if President Biden wins, then some of that form will return. And, um, it's interesting, again, in Asia, if we look at surveys, Pew and other surveys, uh, attitudes towards America are very positive. Attitudes towards China in terms of economics are very positive as well. You know, Chinese tourists, Chinese investments, Mexico and, and the US. If you go to Mexico and talk to Mexican elites, they love the idea of America economically, but they all would rather have America slightly further away. <laughs> so, so you find a very... Um, conflicted uh, attitude in much of Asia towards China and the US. And uh, they do not, they certainly do not want China to be the enforcer of the whole region. They want America to remain as an offshore balancer. And right now to be, to be honest, in, uh, while President Trump has made these sounds about troop withdrawals and he has done so in, in Afghanistan with not very good consequences, um, so far, America is still, you know, the phone ops have 
are still there in South China Sea and so forth. And you know, so that all that stuff is still intact. But the big question remains whether America will enforce so-called red lights. Steve, uh, how does Europe develop? Uh, given the uncertainty, if they, if they're the unpredictability, whether it's Trump or or, or the worry that you can't count on a Biden uh, presidency to fundamentally change, uh, going to see this great surge of strategic autonomy left by led by a, a, a new Franco-German motor. Uh, are we going to see divisions among the Europeans uh, uh, on, on issues like Russia and indeed the United States? Um, how, how does Europe deal with, with the absence of a predictable U.S. leader? Well, badly as usual. Um, but I think people here do look at Biden differently a little than Obama. I mean, Biden is this kind of romantic transatlanticist. He's one of the last of them, um, particularly after, um, after John died. Um, but people remember that he was really against the hit on Osama bin Laden. They thought it was too dangerous. He was against the surge in Afghanistan. He was against intervention in Libya. I mean, this is a guy who's, you know, can be very careful about use of American power and I think that actually might attract Europeans, though it frightens Central Europeans. It probably frightens the Poles and the Baltic nations. Uh, I mean, not just Poland and Hungary who love authoritarian Trump and vice versa. They love American nuclear umbrella. They love American troops on, you know, inside their countries on the borders with um, Russia, which is something Trump did for all his whining about NATO, he actually has done more for deterrence against Russia than um, Obama ever did. Um, so there is this kind of wait and see. Now, you know, who do, uh, the, the Germans certainly want Biden to win. I mean, Trump has beaten up on Merkel as best he can. As I often joke, she's just not his kind of girl. And, she has been um, unwilling to bend the knee. Um, but Macron in France is like an energizer bunny. He's got lots of troubles right now, but he's getting involved with Eastern Med. He's supporting Armenia. He's trying to open up to Moscow, not very easily. Um, he's fighting a big war of words with Turkey even before this happened. Um, and Macron wants a Europe, and I think Europe should be closer to what he wants, which is a huge continent with a lot of money and a lot of people that can stand up for itself, that can have its own voice, that isn't a puppet of um, Washington that is less dependent on it, not in nuclear terms, but certainly in terms of taking care of its own neighborhood in being able to talk about technology to be able to have its own relationship with China, which obviously matters, and, and not just on climate, but on technology, on Belt and Road. Um, you, you know, we always talk about Europe as a whole, which of course, as you know, Evo is, a, is really kind of a mistake. Um, the EU at 27, you know, it's already lost a big one in Britain. It's not the same as the EU at it's just much more diverse and people have different notions of um, what Europe ought to be. So I worry less about, quote, European foreign policy, unquote. I don't think there really is one and there won't be one, but there is a German foreign policy and a French foreign policy and a British foreign policy. And, you know, these actually matter. And I think um, Biden, you know, knowing as many of us do, the people around Biden will see who he ends up with. If he wins, um, there are people that the Europeans at least can talk to. Um, as Francois Heisborn said, it would be like a return to civilization, to at least a president who has some sympathy with Europe and doesn't see Europe as Trump does, as a competitor, as a rival, and the European Union is something set up to frustrate American trade. Um, and so that by itself, I think, would be considered a great benefit. Well, let's, yes, yeah, yeah, Naha, please. I just, uh, I want to echo to a degree what Steve said about um, 
the, the, I, this problem terminology, like what does the word Europe mean anymore? Asia, come on, really? Like, you know, are you gonna put, you know, China in, in the same boat with, with Australia, with India? I, we like in, in this international relations world, we've got to come up with some better phrases, terms, because this, it's just not working anymore. It doesn't even make any sense. But we're going to be looking to our journalists to start the process of redescribing re the world as it is. Uh, a fair point, Nahal, very, uh, absolutely. And certainly you can't do policy on the basis of Europe or Asia, or for, for that matter, these days, the United States uh, uh, in and of itself. Uh, Want to shift gear, uh, Nirmal, to, um, uh, to the second or third or fourth wave of COVID uh, that is uh, really... Uh, coming uh, in Europe, uh, in the United States. But importantly, and in this case, I think you can say this, uh, depending on how you want to, or certainly not East Asia. And there is even an idea now to have an East Asian travel bubble, which would allow people within East Asia, including Australia and New Zealand, both countries that have uh, mastered, uh, at least for now, uh, COVID to allow travel there, but not, of course, to the other parts of the world like the like the United States and Europe. When, when Asia looks at Europe and the United States, the West in that sense, uh, on what's happened in COVID, how, uh, how, how is this, this, this perceived? Uh, and and, and what, what has Asia done right uh, in many ways, which is the question that I think parents and, and, and citizens are across Europe and the United States are asking themselves. Well, this goes back, you know, briefly what Al said. Uh, we have to leave India out of that because India is a bit of a disaster uh, in terms of this COVID response. Uh, it's happening now. But uh, the rest of Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, this is another unfortunate byproduct. Uh, in China, they see the US and Europe response as an utter disaster. China has returned almost to normal. And parts of Southeast Asia are almost back to normal. So they just, they cannot comprehend what is going on in the US specifically. They're more in interested in the US, it grabs more headlines than Europe. Um, I think ob the obvious answers you know, to what has happened in, in America is that a lockdown has to be a lockdown. Quarantine has to be quarantine. You can't sort of have a half-baked lockdown or half-baked quarantine. And it is to, once, you, once you let the cat out of the bag, speak, it's, it's, it's too late, right? So, uh, so these, these half measures and the, 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 the clash of ideas, uh, the mask, whether to, whether to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, this has not been a debate in Southeast Asia. People have been wearing masks for a long time in Southeast Asia. You could argue because of SARS. I mean, they learned that lesson back in 2000 and, uh, 2003 or 2004 when SARS struck and then successive waves of you know, bird flu and so forth. So they have no problem wearing masks. There's no argument. And uh, certain countries in Southeast Asia, like Thailand, for example, which bore the brunt of you know, bird flu, they have very good health surveillance systems in place. And so, so all that added up to, uh, to uh, a societal response, which, uh, which uh, allowed them to, to uh, control, to some degree, the spread of the coronavirus. And um, that sort of, continues now. I mean, uh, the, the travel bubble, like you said, they are trying to negotiate travel bubbles uh, with varying degrees of success. I think that it's, they're doing it very cautiously. They've had, uh, some countries have had uh, bad experiences with travel bubbles. I saw um, uh, um, uh, passengers from Nepal going to some other country which who had tested negative for COVID on boarding, tested positive on arrival. So that kind of stuff is going on. So there's still a lot of wait and see and and, and uh, caution on that. There is a lot of economic damage that continues. I mean, you know, uh, countries like Thailand are suffering greatly from the loss of Chinese tourists. And that is, that, that is part of the reason that the, the government sort of, um, the current government's sort of incompetence, you could say, is, is sort of fed into the, uh, the sort of uh, general uh, protests against it as, as it partly fueled that. But yeah, I mean, mostly across East Asia, I think they see uh, uh, what is happening in the U.S. with, with a degree of horror, I would say. And if, and if a country 
like the United States, where the best science in the world, the best resources in the world can't get its act together and uh, control this uh, virus uh, the, and the impact, the fallout of the virus, then, then it doesn't, doesn't speak well of the US. And going back again to also the foreign policy angle, um, China sees the US as weakened. I mean, not just China. I think others see the U.S. as weakened because of its uh, because of what is happening uh, with COVID nineteen. The economy is down. Of course, the economy is recovering somewhat, but you know it's going to get worse in terms of the of the pandemic in the in the coming weeks. And uh, this huge division, political division in the U.S., uh, the uh, potential for a disputed election. It, it's all that sort of looks like democracy and is, is under great strain and. People are watching to see whether the U.S. will actually come out of this and uh, somehow regain its strength and its um, its uh, its uh, you could say maybe moral leadership. You know, the U.S. now has has sort of is losing the um, the uh, the uh, um, um, legitimacy in terms of lecturing the rest of the world. That's the problem, Steve. Uh, Europeans loved to uh, to lecture Americans about, uh, about how to do this, uh, and COVID was beat, and they had it. They 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 had it really badly in the spring. They they got it under control, and now what is it in the last week? What is it? One point three million cases in in Europe, uh, really driving the global uh, wave. Uh, coming back, lockdowns, et cetera. What's happening in Europe? How did this happen? How did they get it wrong? Well, this is the second wave everyone predicted. We saw it in 1918, they were seeing it again. Um, basically, they loosened up too quickly. They thought it was okay. I mean, different countries had um, different programs and there was a big push to open up borders again, because after all, this is Europe without borders. But frankly, borders are very useful if you're trying to control <laughs> an infection, right? Um, and they were checking people at borders, but not well enough. The testing systems were not in place. The, um, and what I'm, I'm reading now is that there's a, a, a kind of COVID variant, which came to Spain with um, immigrant workers, which has been spreading very, very badly. Now, I don't think it's worse than the original variant, but um, now we have, you know, uh, Britain, you know, trying to have tiers, three tiers, France, which just panicked and basically shut itself down again. Uh, Belgium's been shut down for a couple of weeks. Um, we're back to almost where we were in the beginning in March with confinement. Now the restaurants are shut, the bars are shut, the sports places are shut, the gyms are shut. Um, and frankly, I think they should have done this a while ago. Um, even Germany, which was so proud of how it had handled things. And, you know, let's be honest, it handled things very well. It has this great, big, well-funded health system. Um, you know, Angela Merkel, a very sober speech to the Bundestag a couple of days ago, where she was just very straightforward saying we need to protect each other. We need to think of each other. We need to be responsible to each other. And here, you, you know, there isn't the same politicization of masks or anything. There's just the sense probably that young people, if I can put it this way, who don't get it so badly, um, you know, people are tired of it. They wanted to go out. They wanted to party. They wanted, you know, they couldn't quite live with it. And now I think we're going to have a very, very dark November and people are quite worried about Christmas. I mean, whether people can travel, visit family. It's, a, you know, they're trying again to make sure hospitals are not overwhelmed so they can, you know, work with other patients, cancer patients, <laughs> emergency patients. And I think, you know, in terms of, of that, they're doing pretty well. People have learned how to treat it better. So you get less you know, intensive care and obviously deaths are down per capita. But, you know, this is not 
away anyone wanted to be spending the autumn. And I think people are being abashed. And as we've talked before, my last sentence here, I don't think any democratic government is gonna come out well from this. Um, people are just too angry. I mean, you can sympathize with the difficulty governments have balancing economic well-being and personal well-being, but you know, there's a lot of anger and there's gonna be more anger and, and, and I think governments will pay at the polling booths. Uh, Nahal, we'll, uh, we're going to have one of the first big elections uh, uh, in, in the COVID era. Uh, we, we, we had one of a democracy, well, that was New Zealand, an island, uh, uh, and, and perhaps the exception that is going to prove Steve's rule. But we're having one here. I mean, at the moment that the president is saying, we've turned the corner, uh, we just hit uh, the highest number ever uh, yesterday at, what, 88,000 new cases. Uh, uh, us, uh, uh, deaths again in four figures. Um, uh, how, uh, what's, and, and, and the reality that per perhaps what's happening in Europe is just, we're only in the US two, two uh, or four weeks behind where Europe is. Uh, how do you see this playing out? So, you know, a, a few days ago, Trump's chief of staff essentially said, he kind of raised the white flag. He said, we're not gonna control the pandemic. We're just going to try to focus on getting a vaccine, therapeutic, sort of thing. Now, look, a lot of people criticized him for that, but I have to say there might be a germ of truth in what he's saying, right? I mean, this in this country, I, I don't care, like, who's president. You're just not going to be able to get every single American to follow the rules, to wear a mask, whatever, even if it, it's not necessarily even a partisan thing. It's just like that individual freedom. We do what we want here. Uh, in America. And so I think that, you know, you have the situation where you have a president who, A, is denying, though he's had COVID, he is denying the seriousness of it. Uh, he, he's holding events that are helping spread it. Then you have the, the fact that this is a population that, you know, acts on a very individual basis. Um, and then you, and I hate to say this, but like, this is sad to say, right? But one of the realities that COVID is not deadly enough to make people act in the way they need to act to stop it. Like if, I mean, God forbid, right? But if this was a deadlier disease, if it was like killing children, even the most individual minded American might have a second thought before going out to a bar. But th that's, and I think that's why Trump is able to kind of get away with his approach to this so far. It's because, you know, hey, I had it, I survived it, it'll be fine, right? It's, it's, a, it's a deeply frustrating thing to say. And you wish, you hope that people will learn the lesson from this at least or think, you know, th that this would be the thing that would like, for lack of a better word, like break the fever and make people like act the way that they need to act to help stop it. But I, I don't think it necessarily will. And it's a very, uh, it's a very, very strange and sad thing to say. Uh, yeah, Nirmal, please jump in. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad Nahal raised these points because it's very interesting. If you look at the surveys, uh, you find that Trump supporters, Republican supporters, the COVID, the pandemic is quite low on their list of concerns. Whereas Demo Democratic supporters is high on the list of concerns. So we, what is this dissonance? And you know, President Trump having got COVID and emerged, he's emerged a hero. It's not a big deal. And this is, and what is really fundamental is what Nahal said, is that the, our species seems to react in an effective way only when death is swift and certain. If you remember in 1980s, the panic over HIV AIDS. Now, if you try and, now if you try and interest an editor of a magazine in a big story on HIV AIDS, it's, you know, it's just a shrug of the shoulders because you have medication, you can live for, a decade or more and all that. So it doesn't kill you immediately. SARS mobilized people like nothing had done because it killed very quickly and death was certain. So the White House, well, Mark Meadows said this uh, just the other day and earlier the White House has been touting the so-called Great Barrington Declaration, which is this idea of protecting the vulnerable, the elderly population, but letting the coronavirus go through the rest of the younger population because you know, they don't get so badly affected. It sounds suspiciously to me like, like herd immunity in, in camouflage. 
Steve, uh, final word. Calling the old. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Oh, so final, final word to you as you as you uh, uh, live in lockdown and and uh, uh, is the, what's is there is there the same kind of sense uh, happening in Europe? People are not only are they sick of it, but they actually think that the risks are sufficiently low. Schools were by by for example remaining open throughout Europe. Uh, uh, reflecting that kind of uh, sense, is there a bifurcation? Is are we are we learning something different here about how to deal with this disease, and that's happening in Europe too? I hope so. I mean, I, I think people have understood that actually young kids don't spread it very much, um, and 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 so I think it's okay to have schools open. It's also good for the mental health of kids to um, to socialize, and I think it's good for the mental health of their parents as well to get. The, out of the house once in a while. Um, but I do think what's happening here is, is really they need to break the curve. And the only way to break the curve is to do an effective lockdown. And um, I just, you, you know, I don't think herd immunity, as far as I can tell, you don't get immune very long. So the, the whole point is to try to keep the curve down until a decent vaccine shows up. Uh, Donald Trump says it's going away. Emmanuel Macron says we're going to live with it until at least the middle of next year. So who do you believe? Well, with that, uh, we'll uh, uh, unfortunately uh, have to call the, an end. Next time we're back uh, uh, at World Review, we will at least have had an election. We may not have a result, but we will have an election. In the, uh, in the meantime, uh, great conversation. Nahal Tushi, uh, Nirmal Goj and Steve Erlanger, wonderful to have you all. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all.